If I could have your attention, we'll get started with our uh, final panel of the day. Um, we're going to, we've skirted with this a little bit, but we're going to dive really deep, more deeply into it with geopolitical risk, the, re the return of geopolitical risk, um, whether it's a focus on, on Ukraine, the Houthis, what's going on in Gaza. I think Hussein and the, the rest of the panel are going to jump into some of these issues and see how they um, have impact on these uh, oil issues that we've been talking about, broader energy issues. Um, so our panel this afternoon, let me introduce them quickly. Um, first, John Alterman. Um, John is a senior vice president and holds the Zvinev Brzezinski Chair, Global Security and Geostrategy at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Anna Borshevskaya is a senior fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, and she's the author of a very fine book, Putin's War in Syria. Um, Dave DeRoche is a non-resident uh, fellow at AGSI, we're happy to say. He's also an associate professor at the Near East Asia, South Asia Center for Strategic Studies at the National Defense University, had a 30-year military career, and he's a West Point graduate. Our moderator is Hussein Ibish. He's a senior resident scholar with us at AGSI and a commentator um, across the media front on a broad range of uh, issues. Uh, most recently, of course, he's focused a lot on, on Gaza and uh, related issues. Hussein? Um, we have a great panel, but uh, it's a little fragmented compared to some of the other panels today. So I'm going to do my best to bring it all together and um, give these three uh, guests of ours a chance to provide you with um, a really kind of, uh, uh, you know, a, a integrated overview to some extent. Um, I hope to be able to do that. Um, but certainly there are uh, three completely different uh, sets of specializations going on here. They all, though, have to do with geopolitical risk. And so I think that's what, that's what they have in common, uh, from the defense to the generalized IR to the question of Russia's role. Um, we have a very comprehensive um, set of viewpoints. So I guess I'd like to begin um, with ladies first. I mean, that's only fair. Uh, and to, to look at the, the role of Russia in the international relations landscape of the Middle East as it's unfolding. And it, it strikes me there are um, at least two or three important areas of entry on that, um, on that score. One is Russia's continued centrality to OPEC in, and OPEC Plus, Right. Um, Saudi Arabia is uh, clearly still focused on very strongly on domestic um, and economic uh, agenda that depends on its uh, relationship with Russia uh, through OPEC plus uh, an effort to create a floor and a ceiling for um, energy pricing. At least that's how I understand it in my untutored way. And on that subject, for sure, I claim no knowledge. Um, and then, so the, the question there becomes, um, you know, how does Russia manage that and how do the, the Saudis manage that? The second thing is Russia's really interesting veto, uh, not veto, excuse me, abstention um, at the general, at the uh, Security Council of the U.S., uh, the, the resolution essentially approving of the, um, the Israeli plan, which is actually an American plan, for because Israel hasn't accepted it at all, really, um, for the ending of the war in Gaza, um, it, was, uh, all, it was unanimous except for Russia, even Algeria, uh, which is you know, the only Arab country on the Security Council and has staked out a kind of a radical anti-imperial uh, sort of um, role for itself. And I was just there, and I can tell you that they're very proud of that role in Algeria. Um, but even they voted yes on it, uh, and um, Russia did not. Uh, and then the third thing is Russia's 
continued and maybe even strengthened alliance with Iran, partnership with Iran, um, uh, Russia uh, buying weapons, perhaps, from Iran, they say, and um, certainly emerging more and more as a role. So let's look at all of that and, and give us your sense of where it's all going. Great. Thank you very much uh, for this introduction. Uh, I'm going to try to frame these, these issues uh, from OPEC Plus to Russia's abstention to Russia's growing alliance with Iran into a, a broader context. And maybe that would be the best way to start, start having this conversation, and then we can dive into the details uh, of each of these issues. So uh, the first uh, point that I'd like to make um, and that has to do with Ukraine, uh, which will help us understand the Middle East, is that Russia's invasion of Ukraine was fundamentally never about Ukraine. It was about Russia trying to remake the global order. Uh, Putin frames the war, the invasion, as an existential battle. Um, it is a war uh, where, in his definition, the West supposedly attacked Russia using Ukraine. And when you frame a, a war in such terms, um, first and foremost, you, there are very few lines you're not going to be willing to cross. You, your, your frame of reference of what you are willing to do and versus what you're not willing to do is going to shift. Uh, but second, you're also uh, in it for the long haul. And if we look at this big geopolitical picture and what Russia is trying to do, um, and then zoom into the Middle East, and that is my second uh, major point uh, to, to, for this discussion, is that the Middle East uh, increasingly is the, uh, an arena where Russia's competition with the West is playing out within this bigger picture of Russia's uh, war on the West. The fact of the matter is, and here let me go into a few more details, uh, the fact of the matter is uh, Russia has perceived the Middle East as an arena of competition with the West even prior to the invasion of Ukraine, right? Uh, but the invasion of Ukraine has raised the stakes on, uh, across the board uh, on, uh, on everything. Um, and if we look at how Russia is uh, continuing to fight in the war, in things like uh, the Russian uh, budget for 2024, uh, together with Putin's statements, uh, specific actions on the battlefield, all of these actions point to the fact that not only is Putin, uh, uh, not, only is Putin not willing to stop, it's more as if he can't afford not to stop. In other words, the, the, entire, the, the entire country is turning into a military dictatorship. It's on its way to turning into a military dictatorship. And the entire economy is gearing towards wartime production. So it's a system that really sustains itself through fighting. How does that relate to the Middle East? Well, uh, again, so as I've said before, uh, this was always an arena of competition with the West. But, but the stakes have really shifted after Ukraine. Uh, Prior, even prior to the invasion of Ukraine, uh, on the one hand, Russia always played this geopolitical game of positioning itself as an actor that can uh, talk to all sides, an actor that could mediate between conflicting parties, um, somebody that had relations with all governments in the region, but also major opposition w to them. Uh, but at the same time, if you looked beneath the surface, Russia always leaned closer to anti-American forces in the region. And that was Iran, Iranian proxies, and the Assad regime. Um, what we're now seeing, especially after October 7th, and October 7th was another major uh, uh, inflection point uh, as far as Russians, Russia's, uh, uh, Russia's approach to the region is concerned, is that uh, this veil of pretense has lift, of being friends with everyone, if you will, has lifted even further. Uh, the way Putin has reacted to October 7th, uh, oh, first waiting uh, something like 10 days uh, to, to call Netanyahu and uh, really waiting for, for a long time to make any comments, and then the first words he uttered were uh, blaming the United States, uh, really uh, showed with stark clarity uh, where Putin's primary uh, interests lied, and that was with, again, anti-American forces in, in the region. 
um, that essentially Putin showed that he's no friend of Israel, no matter how, how, how hard he's tried uh, to convince the world uh, otherwise for years. Uh, so, so what, and, and so what does that mean for OPEC plus? What does that mean for the abstention on the, on uh, the vote and the alliance with Iran? Well, first and foremost, Russia um, has been able to sustain its war effort in large part to, to um, appealing to the so-called, what we now call the global south. And the Middle East is part of this global south. It's, it's a term we have. Uh, we don't have a better one. So that's the one, we're, uh, that's the one I'd like to go with, um, unless we find another one. And, there's, there, and this is a very complicated discussion. The fact of the matter is, I guess the main point from that is that the, the region in and of itself, as it looks at Russia, tends to, by and large, uh, it, it had been very careful in how it approached Russia after the war. Uh, at best, overall, the reaction was fairly ambiguous. Uh, and Russian narratives tend to resonate in this region more, than they, more so than they do in the West. Uh, so what that meant in practical terms, it's not just an issue of rhetoric, it's that in practical terms, Russia has been able to find uh, uh, ways to sustain its war effort through continual, through, uh, through, through alternative, creating alternative shipping routes, uh, through uh, re sustaining good relationships with these countries, uh, and ultimately through being able to uh, 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 generate greater oil revenue than the West initially thought Russia would. So that is, uh, that, is a, that, that is one important piece of this story, and a very important piece of this story. Um, the abstentia in and of itself, again, however, shows that from a political realm, really Russia is uh, not only showing what its true colors are, but it feels comfortable to, to do it. Um, and in my view, I would argue this is because the, the, uh, what Russia is getting out of it, the, in other words, the benefits, outweigh the costs. Uh, and the benefits, again, have to do with Russia's perception in the region, Russia's standing in the region, what it can get out of both American partners and adversaries. Um, frankly, it, 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 I think both when it comes to Russia's relationship with Iran, but also with the Arab world, uh, Russia still maintains ties with everyone, and, and it's been able to capitalize and exacerbate an anti-Americanism in the region. It has also been a driver of increased chaos in the region. In other words, it's not so much that Russia was only uh, taking a spoiler role, but really actively driving chaos in this region in order to distract the West from the war in Ukraine. And we're, we're already seeing the results of that. Um, so, so the more chaos there is in the region, the more Russia benefits. Uh, and again, so this comes down to a very simple cost and benefit calculus. Uh, I think Putin has calculated that the benefits outweigh the costs of these actions. Uh, and last but not least, of course, that brings us to the, the, to the deepening, Russia, Russia's deepening relationship with Iran. And I think that is a great note on which to end because I think that is going to be a, a defining, one of the key defining trends of the region uh, going forward in the next year. Uh, for the first time, Russia finds itself reliant on Iran. Uh, specifically for Iranian drones. And that is a big, uh, th that is a major shift in the grand uh, scope of Russian Iranian uh, history. Uh, never before has this happened. Um, but at the same time, and so, so on the one hand, Russia is f more, far more willing to do more to support Iran and its proxies because it needs Iran more. Uh, but also, uh, the, this relationship has a strategic character because you're seeing Iran integrated more and more into regional institutions, such as the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Um, Russia helped Iran launch the satellite from Kazakhstan last August, which raises questions about uh, information technology sharing. So th these are not um, haphazard tactical immediate steps. There, there's, a very, there's more depth to it, uh, I would argue. Uh, and yet, at the same time, again, when you look at the region as a whole, Russia is simply not isolated. Russia retains all of these relationships and, um, and continues to fund its war effort on Ukraine through these relationships. Uh, and uh, especially in the backdrop of five months of stalling of U.S. aid in Congress, we've seen Russia gaining momentum on the Ukrainian battlefield, um, it, uh, in addition to capitalizing on um, Western destruction with, with Gaza 
uh, and with growing growing chaos in the region. So um, this th this year is going to be very important, I think, going forward on all of these major geopolitical trends. And um, on this note, I would like to end. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is this, did I do this wrong? I think I did. There you ah, go. that one. Okay. Yeah. It's not clear at all. All right. Anyway. <laughs> A skilled um, craftsman never blames his tools. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not. Uh, I, I never claim to be skilled at these these uh, uh, buttons. Yeah. Anyway, um, I, I want to turn to John next. Um, thank you, Anna. By the way, um, I want to turn to John next to to look at the at the U.S. role in the region, if you don't mind, uh, um, uh, as a kind of um, a complement to um, Anna's explanation of uh, where Russia finds itself. Um, the United States, the Biden administration is reminding me of Tantalus. I mean, it can see this great prize of, of bringing the Israelis and the Saudis, the two main partners, together. Um, but there's really no chance of getting hold of that, uh, of that golden object, of that, that tantalizing fruit. As where, where does the United States find itself? Because on the one hand... Um, you can you can see all these different paths to um, regaining uh, relevance and leadership and what have you, um, but at the same time, uh, it depends on things like Israeli cooperation on the Palestinian front that just don't seem to be on the table. Uh, and yet, um, U.S. partners in the Gulf um, appear to be similarly sort of continuously drawn back to the United States and, um, you know, uh, secretly wanting, or uh, not so secretly, let's say there's a subtext of yearning for uh, greater U.S. engagement uh, than there has been. So anyway, what do you think uh, where the U.S. has ended up um, at the moment? Um, not where it wanted to be. Uh, this was, you know, for the, the Trump administrations, President Trump, tweeted, so he must have meant it, uh, that the U.S. involvement in the Middle East is the biggest mistake the U.S. ever made. We wasted $8 trillion in the Middle East. I think that the Biden administration came in with a very clear directive. Um, there will be less emphasis on military posture. There's going to be a lot more diplomacy, economic statecraft, basically the, the, the job Brett McGurk had been given was keep the Middle East off the president's desk. Um, I don't think Brett ever put a mission accomplished sign up, but he might as well have, uh, because the Middle East is all over the president's desk. I think the interesting thing, as you've suggested, uh, is for all of the U.S. effort to disengage at a presidential level from the Middle East, for all of the desire to, to have the Middle East take more responsibility for its own security, uh, for all of the effort to build tools of economic statecraft and, and all those other things. When things start to move in the Middle East, the United States is ineluctably drawn to the middle of everything. Mm -hmm. And to a remarkable degree, at least remarkable to me, China has been AWOL. I mean, China's just not had any traction on any of the issues that matter to regional security and regional diplomacy. There's some hand-waving, there's some delegation meeting. But for, if you think back to 18 months ago, or a little less, and you have the Xi meeting in Riyadh, right. you have China brokering the Saudi-Iran deal, all of the commentariat was agog with how China is pushing the United States out, and look, you know, Biden is so incompetent. And the reality is, since October 7th, when there's actual work to be done, the United States is there. Now, P.S., to the delight of the Russians and the Chinese, not meeting with a lot of success. So that frustrates the Biden administration, delights the Chinese, delights the Russians, frustrates the Arab states, but frankly... I, it's hard for me to remember a lot of, I mean, Bill might know. Has there ever been a time in the last 30 years in the Arab states haven't been frustrated with the United States? I mean, for those of you who've been in diplomacy, that's the nature of, the nature of the region is people are upset with U.S. diplomacy. But it seems to me that there is a level 
of anger. Now, now what's happening in Gaza? A level of frustration that the president seems utterly unable to move Prime Minister Netanyahu, mm. despite billions of dollars, despite all the protection, the armaments, all these things, that the president simply looks ineffectual, mm. which I think does lead to a different tenor to frustration with the United States. I still think that, as you suggested, there's a belief that for the things that matter, the United States really doesn't have a peer. Yeah. And to me, the, the, the Emiratis deciding to, to really move with both feet on artificial intelligence is a sign that, yes, they want to engage with everybody, but when push comes to shove on the genuinely strategic things, mm -hmm. where they be in security, where they be in economics, there's a sense that when the chips are really down, yeah. the United States is deeply imperfect, woefully inadequate, mm -hmm. but better than everything else. And I mean, to me, that it's quite uncertain where this goes, right. partly because I have no insight into where Arab-Israeli diplomacy is going to go. It seems to me, as an outside observer, that both the, the Prime Minister of Israel and uh, the leader of Hamas think they're winning as more Palestinians die. Yeah. And I don't see either side. I mean, I understand Hamas gave its response to the Israeli proposal, the American proposal, whatever. I don't see any signs that either side thinks there has been nearly enough, not partly nearly enough killing or not as much killing as there will need to be. That's right. And so it doesn't feel to me like we're on the verge no. of a diplomatic breakthrough. No. I don't know what policy a Trump administration might have. I don't know what policy a second term Biden administration might have. I don't know what is going to happen in Israeli politics which have not yet become unsettled, but could become unsettled. Mahmoud Abbas is 88. Hmm. He could wake up or he could not wake up yeah. in a whole new world, yeah. right? Yeah. So, I mean, so there's a, there's a lot of moving parts here and a lot of uncertainty. I think the United States is relatively well positioned for engagement, but at the same time, extremely poorly positioned for a huge amount of success. Yeah. And it does feel to me like there's going to be a slog, mm. which will not redound to the benefit of the United States. I think the region is in for a wrenching decade, partly because of the aftermath of the war in Gaza, partly because as the energy transition moves, I think it's going to create a lot of volatility in the region in, in lots of ways, part of which is that there are countries that are engaged with the energy transition, and there are countries in the region that haven't really engaged with the energy transition, not least of which is the Iranians, mm -hmm. who are suddenly going to have a potentially dramatic shift in their income streams, which could upend governance in the economy in Iran. And I don't see any signs the Iranians are beginning to think about how they're going to deal with that. No. So I think the region's in for a rough decade. The investments are important. I think a lot of those investments are going to align the region with the United States, educational institutions, workforce development, management, training. I mean, all those, those sort of human capital issues are issues where the U.S. value proposition is incomparably better than either the Chinese or the Russians. Europeans, we can have a debate. But I think the U.S. is, is relatively well positioned in the longer term. I think the region is going to have a rough decade. Um, and the United States will not exactly be the victor, but is certainly not, obviously not leaving the region anytime soon. Well, that uh, I couldn't agree more. That um, John and I often find ourselves in agreement, and um, yeah, I, I think uh, all of that was exactly correct. Um, 
So having, um, having heard an echo of most of what I think just now, uh, I'd like to turn to something I don't understand at all, which is the, the military, um, especially the, uh, the kind of military hardware question, um, military functioning, um, weapon sales, et cetera, um, to uh, Dave DeRoche, um, who will explain it all to us in short order with slides. Thank you. Um, so uh, I uh, have to start off by saying that uh, my remarks do not reflect any view of the U.S. government. And because I was a civil servant and an Army officer in the Department of Defense, I do have PowerPoint slides because the National Defense Authorization Act of 2008 mandates that. Um, They're against our religion. <laughs> yes. It's also... Um, I, I want to thank you all for hanging around, whether it's out of genuine curiosity or personal courtesy. I appreciate it. Uh, it's always hard being the last speaker on a panel because you have the obligation, your other panelists, to listen but, uh, and, and hopefully respond to it. But then um, you're also kind of fixating on what you're going to say, and so you kind of go in and out of consciousness. And when John said deeply imperfect and woefully inadequate, I thought, oh, crikey, I'm being introduced. So, <laughs> so I apologize for that. Um, uh, uh, I, I have to also, um, uh, John noted that uh, Brett McGurk, and um, our, our former center, center director is, has been seconded as the deputy of Brett McGurk, but I always point out that um, if there is a global nuclear exchange, the two things that survive will be cockroaches and Brett McGurk. Um, <laughs> that uh, while he has not hung out a mission accomplished sign, uh, Jake Sullivan certainly, and again, John, you raised um, Tantalus, let me respond with Icarus, and the yeah. paragraph uh, that the Middle East ha is calmer than it has been in decades, uh, which managed to compromise both his skills of prophecy as well as the editorial yeah. reputation of foreign policy, which published Parker's it and then which, withdrew it. Without. When he said it, it was Kind of true. <laughs> it just didn't last more than a couple of weeks. So to quote Harold McMillan, events, dear boy, yeah, events. Right. Exactly. And, uh, yeah, uh, right. and yes, when I was in college, I quoted Harold McMillan to meet yeah. women. Um, I'm going to talk about weapons. Uh, and if I, can, if I can get this to work, I'm going to talk about high technology. There we go. So first off, I want to talk about state versus non-state advantage. This is not something you can measure. These are my impressions in graphical form. So the dotted line on the center is an area where you have parity between state actors and non-state actors. If you look at soldier lethality, uh, over uh, towards the start, non-state actors, that's, think of the British Army using machine guns in the Benin, Benin campaigns in the early 20th century. The state action was significant, but as automatic rifles became the same, uh, one thing I've always said is that, you know, we can spend $50,000 or $500,000 training a soldier. Once he goes through the door with all of his equipment and training, he's in a position of tactical parity or even at a disadvantage with the shoeless uh, gorilla who has a $47 AK. The odds are on the cheaper, man. Yes, thank you. I work alone, Hussein. Um, <laughs> I, I'm Chuck D., your Flavor Flav. Not today. Uh, okay. That was, that was Kipling, not Flavor Flav. Uh, air lethality uh, has generally been a state advantage. You had a, a bit of a dip where um, when the surface uh, shoulder launched anti-aircraft missiles, proliferated without adequate countermeasures. Uh, countermeasures were quickly introduced and the, the state advantage was restored. But what we're seeing now is a proliferation of more exotic surface-to-air missiles. So, for example, the Iranian Bavar is uh, probably at about 60% of where the first generation of Patriot was in the 1970s. Yeah. And I think that we'll see more and more states develop that capability. What's really interesting is the ability to fire missiles. And I'm talking here about surface-to-surface -surface missiles. And what we're seeing is that missiles have proliferated so quickly that while there is the ability to intercept them with some states, the economic advantage, it is so much cheaper to produce missiles, and it is going to get better. And by the way, this chart does not end at the present time. The present time is uh, a little bit to the left of where we are. But the overall economic and technological advantage are moving in the direction of 
non-state actors that they are going to have an advantage on those missiles. So now there are a couple other game changers here. So this, these, I did this in my free time because that's the kind of guy I am. Um, these are all the major oil facilities on the Iranian Kharg Island oil terminal. And the image I took off my iPad for free. <laughs> this is Google Earth. Yeah. And uh, I looked at this, I said, that looks like a thing. This is a level of, if you ever see the initial image of the Corona satellite, which was brought in an envelope in a sealed locked bag, handcuffed to the CIA officer, shown to the president, then put back in the bag and taken back, it looks like a smudge. And honestly, I should have included it. I have it. But the bottom line is, I, you know, you can now target with commercially available means of GPS. You can fix exact firing solutions for this, for um, drones, for uh, artillery, for mortars, as well as for surface-to-surface -surface missiles. And if you combine this intelligence with a reliable and somewhat accurate surface-to-surface -surface missile, you have a strategic capability that is becoming, it is now within the range of non-state actors who have at least some level of proxy sponsorship, and within about 15 to 20 years will be within the range of indigenous capability, only non-state sponsored non-state actors. Um, so let's take a look at missiles. These, of course, are the Houthis. Of course, in the last week, the Iranians have acknowledged, oh, yes, <laughs> you know, we stuck for six years to the fiction that the Yemenis in, uh, developed this indigenous capability, but actually it's our missiles. But the range, and this is only for two years of missile strikes into Saudi Arabia, is profound. And this has had a strategic effect, and it has affected um, the American relationship with the region. It has led some countries to hedge with Russia because they saw an ineffective, from their point of view, American response, as Anna noted. And it has also led to some hedging with the United States. Uh, I was on um, uh, a Dubai television channel in the wake of the missile attacks on Abu Dhabi and Dubai. The questions I was being asked weren't, what's the United States going to do? It was, will you respond with Tomahawk cruise missile launches or a B-52 strike? And I was like, oh my goodness. The answer is neither. And that was viewed as a fundamental betrayal, a fundamental betrayal, um, rightly or wrongly. Um, now, here's what is what technology is doing that's making things interesting. There are a couple of developments here that are of interest. The first one is the um, miniaturization of technology and the increase of guidance that comes from basically the same factors that give me three million times the computing capability of the Apollo mission. Um, Unguided rockets, uh, basically scuds. So you're thinking Soviet Union 1968 model scuds. Um, most of the Iranian missile inventory are improved, upgraded versions of scuds. And what they have done is come up with a module uh, and some other things. You have to put steerable fins on the warhead, things like that. So there is some mechanical adjustments. But basically, for about $5,000 to $10,000, you take out the midsection of the rocket, which is there for stability for the most part, and you can, in, you can put in a guidance unit that allows you to drastically increase your, your uh, accuracy. If you have accuracy, um, you don't need as large a warhead. And what we're seeing is that accuracy, hyper-accurate conventional munitions can now achieve strategic effects. Um, this is Al-Assad Air Base. This is the, missiles, the wake of the missile strike after the killing of Qasem Soleimani. And uh, this analysis again, which is commercial based imagery available to anybody with a couple hundred bucks. Um, uh, what you can see, you know, the this, this space gets overflown about four times a day by planet Earth. You can see here that you're seeing pretty accurate strikes on hangar facilities and aircraft. Um, the uh, community that uh, looks at this, and again, I hang out with fun people, but we're estimating that the circular error probability is between 9 and 15 meters. Circular error of probability means if you fire 100 missiles at a point, what is the circle that half of them will be within? By comparison, in World War II, the Strategic Bombing Survey of the United States Army Air Forces concluded that our CEP was about two miles. Uh, now we're looking at uh, somewhere between 9 and 12 meters for, uh, now these are Iran's most accurate rockets, but the trend is towards increased accuracy. Um, now, second development. The most 
effective means to um, deter against missile attacks, I would argue, is to provide absolute assurance that you kill every missile that is targeted at you. And in order to do that, what you, ha what it, you are at an advantage if there are multiple launches because the missiles have to be moved in place, you get signs that they're being moved. When they fire, they emit a signature. Um, we actually can track most of these from space because it's a very large thermal uh, thing. But when you have increased accuracy, um, you have to fire fewer missiles. So what this shows, uh, PK, the probability of kill, the top is one. So if you achieve a one probability of kill, that means if you fire one missile, you will definitely kill everything. And what this shows is that if you have a three meter CEP, which is about what a, a HIMARS is, um, you achieve, you can be pretty certain if you fire three missiles that you will kill whatever it is you're shooting at. If your CEP is nine meters, which is the bottom, which is what we think is with the lower end of the range for the missiles that were fired at Ainul Assad Air Base. To be 100% sure that, you know, if, if you fire 10 missiles, you can be about 85% sure that you will have hit the target. But the trend is towards increased accuracy, and what that means is that the effectiveness of offensive action, because people will be able to fire one missile instead of 10 missiles, and as you move 10 missiles in a firing location, your intelligence signatures get bigger and bigger and bigger. So the chances of a retail or of a, an anticipatory strike against a missile about to launch decrease, and your chances of destroying a missile after it has launched a missile launcher, a missile crew, also decrease because the signature is much less. So the effectiveness of state offensive action, which is usually a retaliatory missile strike or airstrike, decrease significantly. Does everybody get that? That's a little bit of engineering and operations mm -hmm. research. Okay, great. Second development, hide in plain sight. This is, this is a function of two things. The first is uh, up until about um, 15 years ago, most undeveloped states were very challenged to produce a solid fuel rocket motor for missiles. They had to use liquid fuel uh, rocket motors. And liquid fuel, you don't want to store the missile in that for a long period of time because the liquid will corrode the seals and the surfaces. You have a greater chance of a misfire. You have to have a wider safety radius because the chances of an unintended explosion are much greater from the fuel, not from the warhead. Uh, solid fuel, on the other hand, is relatively inert, and uh, you can just put the rocket motor and the warhead in a shipping canister that... This was an introduction with the Patriot missile again. Uh, the canister itself is also the firing canister, so it's maintenance-free. And you see that with the Russian S-300 surface-to-air missile, the S-400 Patriot, Iranian Bavar, whatever. So what's happened is the Iranians about 2005 kind of came up with a pretty steady, solid motor for their rockets. They realized they could containerize the missiles in maintenance-free containers, which you see here, and then they could put those in shipping containers, which look like every other shipping container, until you pull the back off of it. So it's very hard for us to track these. With solid or with liquid-fueled rockets, you could, through aerial overhead imagery, you would notice the refueling trucks coming, and you could also see the standoff radius that was necessitated by the possibility of an explosion of the fueling. So the signature is much less, and as you can see, these are mobile. This is a commercial truck hauling a shipping container. Much, much more different than trying to track um, uh, liquid oxygen tankers, you know, uh, servicing rockets. And so what that means is that Targets are proliferating again, and the ability is doing that. Um, so this is the Talal, and as you see, it's indistinguishable by the air from a surface missile, and it's got a range of 1,000 kilometers, which is strategically significant. What we don't know is the accuracy of it, but as I've said, the accuracy has increased, and once you've produced the motor and the warhead, as the electronics increase, it's, it's not that difficult an issue to, to upgrade, to retrofit with more accurate guidance systems. Let me shift to maritime drones. Um, in the Ukrainian-Russian war, we've seen a development of this. Of course, they're not used. Um, the Saudi ship Jeddah uh, was hit by a uh, maritime drone and has not returned to service. Um, and the warhead on that was the 
um, warhead from a disused Styx missile, uh, which was the Soviet-era liquid-fueled missile. And again, the motor rotted out and corroded, so they took the warhead off, put it on a boat, and sailed it in the back of the Jeddah. A um, couple of developments in warfare. Uh, the sinking of the HMS Hood and Prince of Wales in 1942 was basically the, the era of supremacy of air power over battleships. Um, the Styx... Uh, hit an Israeli ship in the um, 67 war. That was the first time a ship was sunk by a missile. And in December, the Houthis for the first time were by a cruise missile. And in December, uh, that's the first time that a ship was hit by a ballistic missile. Up until then, ballistic missiles were not accurate enough to do that. And so we're seeing an improvement here. But the second factor, and I'm focusing on maritime factors because when we talk about energy, we're primarily talking about ships. Um, are these drones. Um, I want to draw your attention to the third one on the left, the Magura. That is the one that the um, Ukrainians have currently used to great effect against uh, Russian ships, so much so that the majority of the Russian fleet has relocated from Crimea all the way to Novorossiysk on the far side of the Black Sea. And the challenge of these is that they're so close to the waterline, they're very hard to acquire, and conventional radar has difficulty um, uh, discriminating them from uh, wave tops and normal fluctuations in water. And you can put a lot in them. So how are the Russians dealing with this? And uh, uh, a lot of military futurists give this long talk, and they basically say, we got a lot of problems, and that's the conclusion. But if, I'm not going to do that, <laughs> if we are serious about this, if this becomes a threat and we start to see um, non-state actors with these abilities, and the, the seaborne drones are far easier than ballistic missiles, there are some measures that we can take against them. So here you see deceptive camouflage used by the Russian Navy against seaborne drones. This is, this is in Sevastopol Harbor, uh, similar to uh, the Dazzle ships of World War I. Um, you know, these, the drones, to be effective, usually attack at night, and uh, a lot of times they use thermal imagery. So things such as painting uh, deceptive things along the side of the ship can confuse because they usually use active guidance. Of course, electronic warfare is effective against these, particularly if the thing is moving. Uh, this could be adapted to commercial tankers. Um, for visually guided drones, you could just have, um, say, halogen lights all around the ship and periodically uh, flash the lights, which would blind out any kind of night vision scope and make it difficult to guide it. And of course, another thing that is being revived that we've forgotten is just the use of obscurance. Uh, I like the picture on the top. This is a carbon fiber uh, uh, obscurant, which has the advantage of um, most effective ballistic missiles have a generalized homing that takes them into the area, and then they have an active homing of some sort that allows them to acquire the target and move it. Usually it involves some aspect of radar, and of course carbon and metal obscurance in the area can confuse, confound radar and give you that. So there are profound challenges. It's getting cheaper. We're going to see it in many more areas, and it has the potential to destabilize markets in areas that we haven't seen before, just as the Red Sea is no longer safe for that. But all is not lost. Um, you know, for every measure, there is a countermeasure. Unfortunately, for every countermeasure, there is a counter-countermeasure, and she tells two friends, and she tells two friends. Uh, but um, uh, we're certainly in a brave new world, and a brave new world that has such things within it. And that's all I have. Excellent. Well... I think uh, because we're running close to time, I should just turn it over to the audience and say you've got a very wide range of potential questions you could ask here, uh, Russian policy, American policy, and uh, military technology developments. That's a lot of geopolitical risk. Uh, so um, I'd ask anyone who wants to ask a question to uh, turn your name nameplate um, sideways and... Uh, Maybe if you're way down there, raise your hand. Yes, you Someone, do. okay, go ahead. Yes, sir. Yep. Uh, so, hi, my name is Gopi. I'm from uh, Virginia Tech. I'm a PhD candidate there. So, uh, we heard in the morning session that energy demand can survive despite uh, demands to reduce greenhouse gas emissions uh, and move towards energy transition. We, we're now also being told that we have conflict and cooperation in the Middle East simultaneously. Uh, normalization possible alongside destabilization. Mm. Are, we, are we entering a new normal where uh, we need to get used to peace, no peace despite economic cooperation uh, rather than peace through? 
economic cooperation, as the UAE president said, uh, when they signed ITU to... Uh, so you're, you're suggesting there might be an era where there's political unrest and yet economic cooperation simultaneously. Is that your question? Yes, sir. Uh, All the, right. The, considering Good. the fact that we still okay. have conversations. Yes. Oh, well, we, we got that. Okay. Uh, anybody want to tackle that particularly? I mean, it's a really interesting question. I don't know the answer to it. And I, my guess is that the answer is it's TBD, right? We, we don't know. But uh, does anybody have any thoughts? I got one. Okay, go ahead, Dave. So um, what I think we have to do is uh, I, I, I kind of think in terms of strategic objectives. The, the strategic objectives of every market in the world is to have a placid a uh, place where uh, goods and services can move unimpeded. And unfortunately, the technological developments here mean that uh, what we may have in the past, you know, we, we would focus only on major disruptions like uh, Russia invading Ukraine or the Houthis taking over Yemen and firing missiles. But I, I, I want you to, you know, think back to after the execution of Ken Sarawiwa. OK, uh, you know, in 15 years, a group in Biafra that is unhappy with how they're being treated and they should be um, can possibly acquire the ability to disrupt energy shipping out of Nigeria. And it is not un it is not a difficult exercise for me to name five or ten different groups that have the possibility for significant disruption of civilian shipping in the Bight of Biafra uh, based on the proliferation of this technology, which at the moment, um, there is no one size fits all counter for. It requires active um, uh, measures and active adaptation, which you know, historically, large militaries are not good at, and commercial firms just don't think in the terms of that. So there needs to be a mental shift. Let me add one thing, and, and then uh, we'll go to you. Uh, I, I mean, look, um, it, it also presses states to cooperate more, right, because, uh, you know, these are uh, often transnational forces and unstable forces, so you, it pushes greater cooperation. And I just want to note that, that, that the emergence of this sort of threat um, is precisely why uh, countries like Saudi Arabia and the UAE want it in writing from the United States, because the Carter Doctrine, which is still in effect, uh, you know, is sort of made for uh, circa 1980, and it doesn't correspond to the kinds of security nightmares uh, that Dave has outlined and that really exist, um, and the question marks are very much there. So they want it in writing and, and ratified. Um, you know, just two things. First, uh, because um, Dave intimidated me and said he only works alone. One of my favorite fun facts, you know, is the Houthis use some $3,000 yacht radars to help do all their targeting. Yeah. Uh, I think we are entering a world where non-state actors are going to, be do a lot, going to be able to do a lot more harassment. And I think what we're seeing in the Red Sea yeah. is not something, A, we're going to be able to decisively end with the Houthis, but I think we are likely to see those kinds of incidents more often because yeah. small groups will find it affordable and, and desirable to do. But it the took other, 10 years to defeat Somali or suppress Somali piracy. So it, plus a Tom Hanks movie. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, the other thing which I think sort of requires us to... to rejigger our minds. You know, we have this idea that countries in conflict sanction each other and don't trade. Yeah. In the Middle East, countries in conflict trade their butts off, sure. billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the Emiratis and the Iranians would yell and yell and yell about uh, was it, uh, uh, Abu Musa, the, the greater tomes and the lesser tomes, right? Yeah. Three hours. Yeah. yeah. Right? With $13 billion a year in trade. Right. Right, the Turks and the Iranian uh, and the the Israelis, mm -hmm. back and forth, horrible, horrible. Three billion dollars in trade, four billion dollars in trade. Sure. I think th we have an assumption that economic ties create cooperation, and if there's tension, it cuts economic ties. And I think what we're likely to see a lot of in the Middle East is countries that have political tensions and maybe even military tensions but still maintain robust economic 
relationships. We have seen it much more than we give it credit for, yeah. and I think we're going to continue to see it a lot. But what might be more complicated in a good way is a greater in integration of infrastructure, both hard and, and electronic and all, and, all core, and all sorts of reasons to, to build um, mm -hmm. electricity grids. Exactly. Right? I mean, all kinds of reasons. Right. And that, that provides a, a negative, a disincentive to, to um, greater conflict and confrontation but more also, than trade does. But it creates targets for non-state actors. Uh, as, of course it does. Right? As, as the, the pipelines sure. between Egypt and, and Jordan were. Yeah, anyway. of course. Yeah. If I, if I could uh, also follow up on on, uh, on David's and John's comments to, to answer your, your very interesting question. Um, one of the things also I think, one of the lessons from uh, the Houthi uh, 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 example on the, uh, on the Red Sea is that if every, the, rest, with the rest of the world watching, the lesson that, that our, both our friends and adversaries would draw is that if you want uh, to get the United States to expand some of the most expensive military equipment. It's fairly easy and cheap to do if you place it in strategic uh, choke points uh, across the world. Right. And that is something that I think, well, certainly Russia well, was watching very carefully. So when you think about what Russia might be able to do, empowering proxies um, in some capacity, which is what they've done before, I think is, is something you can very much count on. And again, from a Russian perspective, uh, the, the playbook is to do these things on the cheap. At the same time, and there's two related points to this, um, Russia ultimately doesn't want to see so much, Russia doesn't want to get so involved in a conflict that it draws its attention away from Ukraine. Mm. What they're doing is they're trying to create strategic dilemmas for us outside of Ukraine, right? right. Um, but uh, but they, what they don't want is for their own costs to go up very high. Right. Uh, so from their perspective, watching the Middle East boil over in a way that requires their own presence is not a good scenario. Um, at the same time, when, from a, again, from a Russian perspective, the idea of simultaneously competing and cooperating are not mutually exclusive. Uh, it, you know, years ago, Lavrov had said that they compete with Iran in the energy market, but they cooperate in, in other issues. So the, the idea that you can hold, the, these two ideas are simply not mutually exclusive. Yeah. Okay, so Doug Silliman's going to have the last uh, question here. I, I apologize to the one uh, question, but we are running out of time. Yeah, uh, so the big boss gets the last question. <laughs> Thanks, Hussein. Um, I want to go back to Hussein's original question to Anna about Russia and OPEC Plus, but I want to ask Anna and John the broader question. Do you see Russia, China, or other regional medium-sized powers using energy um, as a strategic weapon or as, as a strategic jumping off point. In other words, as you were saying, Anna, can, if Russia can create diversions for the United States in the Middle East that keeps us occupied there, that's good for Russia. Is their role in, in uh, OPEC Plus part of that? Or what, is, what do they think of OPEC Plus? And maybe, John, more for China and Asia. What, how do the Chinese think of geosecurity in terms of their energy needs, at least in the short medium term? Good with buttons. <laughs> buttons suck. Buttons suck. Uh, I, look, I, I think the short answer to your question is yes. Russia is that. That this is something that Russia is trying to do because, um, what? Because it is precisely because of Russia's ability to generate oil revenue that it's able to sustain its war effort. So this is this is a key priority for Russia. And on the flip side, I think countries like Saudi Arabia, uh, I think genuinely see Russia as a key player in the energy market, no matter how the war is going to end. So I think that when we, we have to look at it from the Russian perspective and from the regional perspective, uh, I think that the, the, there are all of these issues that we've explored, um, they're bo both of their frustrations with us uh, and their, their um, perceptions of Russia, the war, uh, they, in my, from, from what I can see, these countries want to have a diversified foreign policy. They don't want to put all their eggs in one basket. Um, and, and Russia is simultaneously uh, using this situation as an opportunity, but also exacerbating it by projecting its own narrative in order to extract practical uh, results. And it has to do with energy shipments and, and production. Um, I think China sees the Middle East sort of 60 percent vulnerability, 40 percent opportunity. The vulnerability is 
they think the Persian Gulf is an American lake. Mm -hmm. They don't have anything like the Fifth Fleet. They won't. Um, they feel the United States can cut the Straits of Malacca. They feel that, that and the United States is the world's largest energy producer, right? And that drives them, it's just right. not fair yeah. from China, right? And so you add this to the fact that their population is aging, their population is shrinking. They don't have any of these advantages the United States does. Mm -hmm. We're a larger economy. I think that the Chinese look and they say, this is just one more example of why the world is unfair, mm. because the United States has a stranglehold on this part of the region, this part of the world, that we can't escape our dependence on. Since China became a net oil importer in 1993, they've been getting half their oil from the Middle East. Right. They keep trying to get less than half their oil. They can't figure out how. Yeah. They keep getting half their oil from the Middle East. So 60% vulnerability. Right. Where's the opportunity? Well, the Middle East is full of countries that the United States tries to keep people from engaging with and investing in, so it's greenfield investment opportunities for China. The United States, getting, the United States keeps getting into fights in the Middle East. Great for China. If we have three carrier strike groups on station at any given time, right, because they're either in repair or they're going back and forth, if we have three on station and two are in the Gulf, that means only one's in the Western Pacific. Great for China. To the extent that we alienate countries, great for China. The way China sort of whips up sentiment in the global south, yeah. which China has a great power. It starts, oh, but we're really part of the global south, right? Great for China. So I think that China sees the Middle East partly as an economic opportunity. Here are countries that have money to spend. China will build, as people have told me, an 80% solution at a 60% price. Very attractive if you're trying to get... The, the full capacity, the listed capacity of the pipeline the Chinese built across the UAE, good luck with that. But it's cheap and it gets built quickly and people like it. And by the way, the Chinese are also happy to pay bribes. Mm. Sometimes they'll pay bribes in advance. Local governments like that. So the Chinese will, will they'll make money there. And there, as I said, there are countries that others won't work with. So Iran is, is an open book for them. The Chinese are constantly abusing the Iranians because the Iranians don't have an alternative except recently for Russia. And the Chinese never fail to remind the Iranians that you have no alternative. Right. So there are some opportunities. I think most of the opportunities have to do with undermining us because from a Chinese perspective, we're the big strategic game, not the Middle East. And here's what I think is a really important point that I'll close on. The United States can't get over the fact that the Middle East has been strategically important to the United States for decades. And while we've tried to withdraw from our strategic focus on the Middle East, I think what we've seen since October 7th, mm -hmm. it's really hard to do. The Chinese have never been interested in getting more deeply engaged strategically in the Middle East. The Chinese strategy is we're fighting the United States. Right. And how do we use the Middle East as an instrument in that battle rather than how do we either replace the United States or contest the United States or, or, or get into a struggle with the United States in the region? The whole Chinese strategy is using the Middle East to advance China's U.S. strategy. Yeah. Well, we are sort of doing their work for them by, you know, attempting to maintain maritime security and free flow of commerce, which is their main interest. Anyway, uh, thanks, I, I would argue, anyway, at the moment. Um, thanks very much, uh, Anna, John, and uh, the estimable Dave DeRoche. Uh, so uh, that, that's the end of our panel. We've just um, gone only 10 minutes over time. And um, thank you very much. <laughs>